Welcome back, forensic students. Today, our topic of focus is over crime scene photography. And now, as we move through the lesson, just be sure to pause as you need to to ensure that you've got all the important points in your notes. All right, so forensic photography documents and preserves the original crime scene for future investigation. Uh, photographs are used in conjunction with notes and sketches. So, Photographs are um, important as are notes and sketches, and these three things work together as an important part of the forensic documentation process. Crime scene photographs have tremendous value because they can show the entire layout of the crime scene, the position of each piece of evidence, and then that evidence's relationship to other ob objects and location um, to one another at the crime scene. Now, the most important prerequisite for photographing a crime scene is for it to be unaltered. So, unless somebody has to have medical attention or in um, an emergency situation, objects must not be moved until they have been thoroughly photographed. We want the photos to showcase the crime scene in its most raw form. And this is very important. Um, so, sometimes I get the question, what happens if an investigator unintentionally alters the crime scene before photographs are taken? And this happens from time to time. So, if evidence is moved, it has to be documented in its new position, uh, and then detailed notes have to be made about its original location. And if this is not, uh, if this is not done, this could lead to compromised evidence and, of course, case integrity. Um, this could make it very difficult for investigators when they're trying to reconstruct the scene for analysis. Uh, and this can also be um, lead to potential legal ramifications uh, for the investigator in extreme cases. So the ideal procedure is to just document the, the mistake if, the, if a mistake is made. Now, in order for photographs to be admissible as evidence, so that means brought into the courtroom, a judge buys off, these photographs can be presented to a jury um, in the justice system, photographs have to meet the following criteria. So one, they have to accurately reflect the true condition of the scene without any alteration. Any manipulations, we talked about this just a second ago, so any manipulations have to be documented. And then these photographs have to um, have relevancy. They either have to support or undermine the truth at any point um, for any issue that is um, being brought before a judge or jury. So this means that every photograph taken at a crime scene has to be directly related to the facts and the issues of that case. Now, currently, digital photography is the preferred method of crime scene photography, and a digital camera just uses a microchip to convert light into these electrical signals that are processed and then stored as digital data. Crime scenes have to be photographed as completely as possible. We've already said that before in this lesson, uh, but it's super important. Photographs uh, have to be made of the area where the crime scene took place, and that's the entire area. Also, adjacent areas to the crime scene. So um, maybe if the crime scene is uh, a house or home, um, maybe the woods beside the home or the driveway or the next door neighbor's house. So the entire area and adjacent areas to the crime scene have to be photographed. You have to take overview photographs. Um, also photographs of entry points and exit points have to be made. If there's a victim or a body, you would want to of course, take photographs of that. And then, of course, all evidence has to be marked and then photographed. And we've already talked about that in a previous lesson. All right, so let's talk just a second about overview photographs. So the first images that a forensic photographer is going to take are overview photos. Overview photos are going to include the entire scene and its surrounding areas. Overview photos are generally shot from a natural perspective. Um, but can include aerial shots. So sometimes uh, investigators will have drones and they use to take aerial shots, which is helpful. Overview photos begin from a distance and then gradually zone in on the specific area of the crime. And they should be taken from the outside borders of the scene and from various angles. So here's an example of uh, an overview photograph. So you can see here in this um, photograph, I'm, 
um, we have a victim, we have a body, and the forensic photographer has just captured uh, the scene. We can see that we have a body in the scene, uh, and then we can also kind of see the surrounding areas. So you can get a general idea of where the crime took place, where the body was adjacent to, um, you know, this building and, and um, some different trees and bushes. Uh, and it just gives anybody looking at the photographs just an idea of the surrounding areas of the crime. You'll also want to take uh, photographs of every entry point and exit point. And there's a lot of different reasons behind this, but points of entry and, entry and exit uh, should be shown and in such a manner that any marks of force are clearly shown. So you can see here in this picture, this uh, is an image taken from a crime scene. This was a home that was burglarized. And we can see that the perpetrator, or that perpetrator in this case, actually did enter the home by kicking he kicked in the door uh, and the damage to the frame and the hardware is showcased in these crime photos which is helpful all right so we also want to photograph evidence and there's some specific procedures that uh, sort of go along with photographing evidence so investigators have to use proper technique when photographing evidence um, the investigator is going to want to use an item of scale. So an item of scale needs to be uh, in the photograph. This can be a ruler or a quarter or sometimes investigators will use a pen that they have. A lot of times evidence placards or evidence markers will have built-in items of scale. They'll have built-in metric rulers. Um, and the purpose of this is we're just placing something uh, in the photo that provides reference for the size of the objects in the picture. Now, each piece of evidence has to be photographed at three different angles. That's a minimum, a minimum of three different angles, and each angle has to be photographed at three distances. So we'd like to have a close shot of the evidence, we have like to have a mid-range shot, and then uh, a far-off shot, a long-range shot. So three different angles, three different distances. We're talking a minimum of nine total photographs per piece of evidence. Now, investigators are generally going to take uh, far more than nine uh, photographs, but nine is the minimum. As evidence is discovered, the evidence is photographed, uh, and it's photographed to show its position and location relative to the crime scene. And here's an example. Earlier, I said that a lot of investigators now use the evidence placards or markers uh, that have built-in scales on them, items of scale. So you see here we have a metric ruler, and that just shows whoever's looking at the picture, looking at the image um, of the approximate size of the evidence. All right, here's another example of photographed evidence. So we can see a couple things here. So we can see that an evidence placard is used to mark the evidence. Um, it's numbered. And of course, we know that there's going to be notes and sketches that are also going to have the same piece of evidence uh, numbered. And we can see here that we have taken three different photographs at one angle. And we have uh, a far off shot or a long range shot, which is what you see in the upper left corner. And then in the far right corner, uh, upper right hand corner, you see a sort of a mid range shot and then a close up shot for the bottom left hand corner. So we need to photograph every piece of evidence at three different angles and each angle photographed at three different distances. Or sometimes evidence is difficult to see and photograph, so we have to utilize um, something that's helpful in forensics, which is called oblique lighting. So oblique lighting can help investigators make evidence visible so that it can be photographed. And I'll show you an image in just a second of how this works. It's really kind of awesome. Um, but oblique lighting just uses a light source like a flashlight uh, and it's going to be positioned at a low angle and what this is going to do is this low angle is going to cast a shadow on the surface of the evidence and it makes it visible when it's photographed. So oblique lighting is commonly used when photographing impressions. It works really good when we're photographing tool marks and then also cer certain types of fingerprints. 
So you can see here we have a flashlight. We've turned off all the lights at this crime scene. Um, we have a flashlight. It's positioned at a low angle and it casts a shadow on this footprint and it makes it visible. And then when we capture it uh, with digital photography, we can really make it pop. We can see the tread pattern, uh, which is great for forensic photography. Here's another image. Uh, so you can see on the left, this is a crime scene. Um, this crime scene has like dusty footprints, but you can't see them in the image on the left. Um, so they're there, but we can't see them. But if we turn off the lights and we position uh, a low beam light at a low angle, then um, it makes those dusty fingerprints or footprints in this case, um, just kind of show, and then they are captured through digital photography. So again, we can see the tread pattern here, um, and it works really good. So this is called oblique lighting. All right, that ends our lesson for today. If you're in class today, we're going to watch a short video over how crime scene photography works, but if you're not in class, you're watching this video online, um, then we are done, and I will see you in the next lesson.